Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Red Hawks. My name is Angelo Genova, and I'm of the class of 1975. Almost 50 years ago, I was the student body president and spoke at the inauguration of Dr. David Dixon, who was then president at the time. Today, it is my honor to serve as Master of Ceremonies for this portion of the investiture of President Jonathan Coppell. Seated before you, wearing academic regalia, are representatives of universities from across the nation, as well as members of the faculty here at Montclair State and the deans and vice presidents. They will process to the Memorial Auditorium after our brief program here in the amphitheater. Following our program, students are invited to a watch party in the student center. Sign language interpreters for today's ceremonies are Tricia Dolan and Alexis Birdsall Griffiths. Alex, I understand, is her first name. Thank you for your assistance today. Today's music is performed by members of the Montclair State University Wind Symphony and that's conducted by Thomas McCauley. And now I ask you to please rise and remain standing as we welcome the platform party. Leading the platform party is the Grand Marshal, Dr. Sandra Adams, Professor of Biology, 
She carries the university mace and ornamental staff symbolizing the university and the president's authority. Now I invite the platform party to the stage. Now I ask that we please welcome the honor guard of police officers from the University Police Department and ask those to remain standing on the stage. Please welcome the honor guard of police officers of the University Police Department and our neighboring communities, Montclair, Clifton, and Little Falls. Please observe a moment of silence to, to honor our nation's military service members and veterans, police officers and first responders. We acknowledge their servitude with deep gratitude. Thank you. Now I ask you to please be seated and make yourself comfortable. I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage Faith Victor, a graduate of the class of 2022 and a student member of the Board of Trustees from 2020 to 2022. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, staff, and Board of Trustee members, good afternoon. My name is Faith Victor, and I served as a student trustee from 2020 to 2022. Thankfully, I'm a part of the class of 2022. I had the honor of sitting on the selection committee as well as to personally interview President Coppell. And on behalf of every student at Montclair State, we say thank you. Sorry about that. My favorite thing about President Coppell is his humor. I know it's weird to say a president, his humor, but President Coppell has a gift where he can make any situation funny and bring light to it. 
And today, I honor you, President Coppell, and I thank you for bringing a sense of humor, bringing joy, and bringing peace to Montclair State. And congratulations on your investiture. Thank you. I know from personal experience that that's a big job that Faith Victor has as your representative. So let's give her a round of applause. Fifty years ago, I stood in this very uh, spot, literally this very spot, as a bright-eyed, eager, long-haired, idealistic undergraduate student body president to welcome Montclair State College's first black president, David Dixon. Now much older, maybe wiser, but clearly with much less hair, I am again privileged to serve in a similar role in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Capel as Montclair State University's ninth president. Standing here today in this beautiful amphitheater with all of its history and secrets of clandestine meetings and romantic interludes, I'm reminded of a different time, but a not so different reality. Then, we faced a nation still reeling from the assassinations of Senator Robert Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King, a nation divided by a faraway war and by a student and racial unrest at home, and a constitutional crisis occasioned by a United States president who abused the powers of his office to obstruct justice and attack his enemies. As they say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Here and now, the parallels to those dark days appear to be repeating themselves in a nation still much divided and whose foundations of democracy and the rule of law are at the risk of demise. However bleak that may sound, I find solace and hope in knowing that all is not lost for the future because there's also another constant from the era 50 years ago that is repeating itself. And that constant is that this university remains. It remains as a beacon of hope and a bulwark against negative forces in our lives and our communities. This place continues to promise that the next generation will be prepared to embrace the daunting challenges of the future with the same bright eyes and eagerness and energy that stirred in me as a student here. And today, this place continues to give us faith in the future because it has been true to its core mission of the past to be a place that welcomes the first generation of college students, the children of new Americans and immigrants, a place that cultivates the minds and creativity of a diverse and energetic student body, and finally, a place that lays the foundation for thousands to enter life with the skills, tools, and values to make a difference in our world and in our communities. This one constant from that era 50 years ago is worthy of our celebration. And I have no doubt that it will be a constant that our new president, Dr. Capel, will embrace with vigor. Today, in this place, we are in an oasis of celebration and hope. Today, we savor this moment to reflect on the growth of this institution from college to university and all that that means. Today, we are reminded of the much to be thankful for stewardship of MSU leaderships of our past, Drs. Reed and Dr. Cole here today. And today, we are excited to usher in the future leadership of Dr. Jonathan Capel, who will no doubt bring the passion, intelligence, creativity, and vision of a new generation to his presidency. Dr. Capel, on behalf of the many alumni of this special place, who, like me, were the first in their families to go to college, children of immigrants, and the varied races and creeds of our diverse society, and for what many thanks for what MSU has done for our lives. I am so very pleased to welcome you and wish you Godspeed as you assume the awesome duties and responsibilities of this presidency. Thank you. We are very honored today to have full, two former presidents of Montclair State University here, Irvin Dexter Reed and Susan A. Cole.
Irvin Reed served as Montclair's president from 1989 to 1997. Under his leadership, Montclair State College transformed into Montclair State University. Under his leadership, Montclair expanded its relationships with universities in other countries and created new opportunities for students to study abroad. His lasting legacy includes the construction of the Ice Arena and Yogi Berra Stadium, the opening of the Academic Success Center, which continues to support students today, and expanding the use of computers for teaching, learning, and operations, including allowing students to register for courses by telephone, a wonderful and imaginative in innovation at the time. Could you imagine that? Prophetic, quite prophetic, Dr. Reed. So please welcome former President Irvin Reed to the podium. Good afternoon. Uh, what a glorious day, and I'm so delighted that I've been invited to be a part of this. Thank you, Angelo, for that wonderful introduction reflecting on how technology has changed over all that time. Greetings to the faculty, staff, administrators, student and alumni, to delegates representing other universities, the members of the Montclair State Board of Governors, uh, Board of Trustees, President Emerita Cole, and particularly you, President Capel. The newest member and the ninth president of this extraordinary community, I say to all of you who brought you here, congratulations. Thanks so very much for asking me to be a part of this. President Emerita Cole, what an extraordinary 23 years of leadership you have had. Congratulations. <laughs> President Capel, before I first came to this campus in the spring of 1989, I saw a campus of phenomenal achievement. I quickly had a vision of what it could become and, reach, and how it could reach even higher heights. However, I did not want to get too far ahead of the Board of Trustees, the faculty, alumni, and particularly the students, without understanding what they thought I could bring to the mission of an already outstanding institution. After much consulting and listening, discussing and reflecting, one thing became very clear. The board did not bring me here to maintain the status quo. I have no doubt that as Susan Cole explored her potential impact here, she also realized they were not bringing her here either just to maintain the status quo and wow she seized the day and implemented an era of transformation <laughs> now president Coppell, it is your turn no doubt your vision for the centrality of a university at the heart of the community of which it is a part has brought you to montclair state at a propitious moment in time I am sure it has helped you to be able to bring your essence and style of your leadership here at this time. No doubt, through the deliberative process of shared governance and student participation, your vision of an inclusive campus will broaden the mandate of Montclair State University to become New Jersey's premier public serving university and to earn national recognition as a model of 21st century higher education. You should be congratulated for giving such a prominent role to your students as a part of your investiture today. It already shows you as a leader committed to the sensitivities of those you serve. When I left Montclair, I appreciated all of the kind words that were spoken and written by everyone, but mostly I wanted to leave with the love and affection and appreciation of my students. The Montclairian, the student newspaper, also had glowing comments about me, but there was a cartoon about my planned departure, and I brought it with me today. <laughs> it shows me as a hobo, tiptoeing out of town along the railroad track, using my accomplishments as president that Angelo just mentioned, university status, global education, doctoral programs, etc., as stepping stones to leave town to get to my next job. 
In my eight years as president, the Montclairian had several cartoons about me. They were funny and mostly respectful, occasionally acerbic. None was as creative and, as, and endearing as that one. That is the love and appreciation that I truly hope you will have throughout your presidency. Regardless of how they say it, draw it, protest it, while sometimes being brutally honest, your students will always appreciate you for giving your best to our beloved Montclair. For your many years ahead, I wish you the very, very best and carpe diem. Thank you, President Reed, and thank you for returning to share that with us. Dr. Susan Cole served as president from 1998 to 2021, and if memory serves me right, she was the first woman president of Montclair State University. During her 23-year tenure, the university grew stronger, larger, and more complex rising to become a doctoral research university with a growing national reputation. Under President Cole's leadership, the university opened up four new schools and colleges, hired hundreds of new faculty members, grew enrollment from 12,000 students to 21,000 students, and greatly expanded the diversity of the student population, built many billion buildings, and modernized the campus to support 21st century teaching learning, and research. In recognition of her many accomplishments, when President Cole retired last year, the Board of Trustees renamed Montclair's original College Hall in her honor and conferred upon her the title of President Emerita. Please join me in welcoming President Emerita Susan Cole. Thank you, Angelo. My dear friend, loyal, and astute advisor for more than two decades. And what an honor and a pleasure and a joy it is for me to be up here and to see again the esteemed President Reed. So great to be with you. A great president to follow. And I followed him in line today. Yeah. Right. So, hello, Montclair State. Hello. How nice to be back with you all on campus on this beautiful fall day. We are gathered as a community to celebrate the formal investiture of Montclair State University's new president, Jonathan G.S. Coppell. Some of our students, and indeed some others among us, may be wondering, why all the fanfare? Why all the fancy gowns and the processions and the many, many speeches to come? Luckily, I am here to answer that question. You may think at first that it's all just about Jonathan, but smart, accomplished, handsome, and as he pointed out to me, tall, yeah, as he is, it's not just really only about him. It's really about two important ideas. First and foremost, Today's ceremony is about the importance of higher education and what the establishment and growth of universities across the world in over hundreds of years has contributed to the progress of humanity. Every member of this university community is individually and personally part of that history and heritage. Where you sit, generations of others have sat before you 
and they have gone on to do great things in the world. They have pushed forward the exploration of space. They have discovered treatments for disease. They have occupied positions in government. They have performed on Broadway and in concert halls around the world. They have taught thousands, hundreds of thousands of children. They were educated here, and they have carried that education out into the world where they have worked and they have served. And now you are here, and after you will come the next generations of students, teachers, and researchers. And today, we celebrate and reflect on our individual place and this university's place in an important part of history. The second idea behind all the fanfare and fancy gowns is very simple, but an absolutely critical concept, and it is this. Leadership counts. Leadership really counts. No enterprise of importance in the world can, can, can succeed without competent, dedicated leadership. When we look out at the world and we see instances of destruction, despair, and corruption, what we are seeing is failure of leadership. That's what it is. Montclair State University has an honorable history of success, of growth and progress in the realization of its important mission. And today, we come together as a community to acknowledge the awesome responsibility that President Coppell assumes as the leader of this university. There are, not to oversimplify, but I will, there are two kinds of leaders in this world of ours. There are those leaders who get up every morning and ask, what's best for me? What can I do today to get more power, more money, more adulation, more of whatever I want? And then there are those leaders who get up every morning and ask, What's best for the people and the institution and the communities I serve? What can I do today to make the world better for them? The students of Montclair State and our sister universities around the world are in the process of learning how to be that second kind of leader the one who is both knowledgeable and capable and who leads not for personal gain, but for the betterment of society. Jonathan Coppell will be that kind of leader for Montclair State. And today, with processions and robes and many, many speeches, as a community, we say to President Coppell, you have taken on a really important assignment, and we are confident in your ability to serve us in the role of president with distinction. All the regalia and the ceremony are a way of saying, as a community, that we will support you in the work you must do, and we know that you will support this community in the work that it must do. And you will be our assurance that this university continues to fulfill its place in the great history of human development. And so it is my pleasure and my honor to call forward our president, Jonathan Coppell. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Does it get nicer than it is today? I don't think so. So when we were contemplating, when we were contemplating the plans for this day, I desperately wanted to include this amphitheater as part of the festivities because this is in some ways the the beating ancestral heart of Montclair State University. And there a bunch of people said, yes, but it could rain. I said, it's not going to rain. I know a guy. But we had to include it, and I, I felt that the most important th way to use this venue was to include in a major way the most important constituency of this university, and that, of course, is you, our students. You are the most important audience today. Now, in true, in true professorial fashion, I want to engage in a colloquy with my learned colleague, Dr. Cole, because I too have a theory as to what, what we are doing wearing these ridiculous robes. How many of you are one, like, you're looking at it, it's like you people look absurd. We're wearing foofy hats, we've got stripes. By the way, the more stripes is better, just so you know. So, so my, here's, my, here's, my, here's my take. It's related. These robes actually originated in the Middle Ages. That's when universities started. And by wearing these robes, we are connecting the work that we do today to a project that began more than a thousand years ago. The project is the advancement of humankind. That's the project. It's never going to be done. And it's not a perfect upward path. There are going to be setbacks across, along the way. But we are all endeavoring to be part of that project. Someday, you will walk across the stage and you will receive a diploma from Montclair State University. Yes? You're going to wear one of these ridiculous robes. And that comes with an assignment to be part of that project. And we need your effort. We need your industry. We need your intellect. But mostly, what we require is your optimism. And that's what today means to me. I was really struck by Angelo's reference to the tumultuous days past. Because there have been many times in our country's history when we felt divided and desperate and it seemed like improvement and better days ahead were impossible to imagine. And yet, and yet, even though the circumstances were different, people like you, who were optimistic about what could be done, about what you can do with your future, you made a difference and you took us forward. And the fact of this university, which has gained so much under the leadership of President Cole and President Reed and their predecessors, that shows that your optimism is justified, and we will do great things together. So thank you for allowing me to be your president. I am so excited to be part of this Montclair community because I know what we are capable of. Thank you so much. And I'm going to do this inside. It's a little premature, but there's a thing that I like to do, which is take a selfie. And I always tell graduates, this doesn't count until I take a selfie. So if I don't do this, I'm not legit. So I need you to be in a selfie with me, if you don't mind. Is that okay? All right, here we go. You got to stand up and make some noise. All right. All right. Thank you. So this concludes the amphitheater portion of our program. The Honor Guard will lead the academic procession to Memorial Auditorium, where President Coppell will be formally invested. Students, please remain seated until the academic procession has exited the amphitheater. Thank you today for your patience. Thank you for your attention. You all look great, and I hope uh, you put that uh, selfie on Facebook, Dr. Coppell.
Instagram. 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 Got it. Got it. Instagram. I'm showing my age.
It is now my pleasure to welcome Harrison Smith, who will sing the national anthem. Harrison is studying for a BFA in musical theater and a BA in linguistics. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? Or the land of the free and the home of the Please be seated. Associate Professor Mark Clutterbuck will now present the university's land acknowledgement. Earlier this year, President Capel adopted Montclair State University's first ever native land acknowledgement. This statement was developed by members of the university in close consultation with leaders of New Jersey's state-recognized tribes. It acknowledges the history of the ground on which we stand, and it highlights Montclair's commitment to actively supporting a vibrant present and a bright future for all indigenous people. We are fortunate to have a president who comes to us with a proven track record of respectful collaboration with native communities during his years in Arizona. His understanding of indigenous matters and his support for authentic partnerships is greatly appreciated. It is also my privilege today to acknowledge two of Montclair's closest tribal collaborators, Turtle Clan Ramapo Chief Vincent Mann and Michaeline Picaro Mann. Welcome. We are honored that you both have joined us today for this momentous occasion. And now, our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that Montclair State University occupies land in Lenape Hoking, the traditional territory of the Lenape. As a state institution, we recognize and support the sovereignty of New Jersey's three state-recognized tribes, the Ramapo Lenape, the Nanticoke Leni Lenape, and the Powhatan Renape Nations. We also recognize the sovereign nations of the Lenape diaspora elsewhere in North America, as well as other indigenous individuals and communities residing in New Jersey. We commit ourselves to addressing the legacies of indigenous dispossession and to dismantling practices of erasure that still persist today. We embrace the resilience, persistence, and richness of contemporary indigenous communities, as well as their role in educating all of us about justice, equity, and the stewardship of land across generations. Please welcome Francis M. Cuss, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, who has been on the board for 13 years and chaired the presidential search. 
Welcome, welcome, welcome to the investiture of Montclair State University's ninth president, Dr. Jonathan Capel. Montclair faculty, staff, students and alumni, university leaders and representatives, elected and appointed government officials, my fellow trustees, former presidents Reed and Cole, distinguished speakers and honored guests. It's very much my great pleasure to greet all of you on this historic occasion. I want to extend a very warm and special welcome to President Capel's wife, Jennifer Steen, their children, Elsa and William, and to all of the President's relatives and friends who are here in person or who are joining us on the live stream. Welcome. <laughs> on behalf of the entire Board of Trustees, President Capel, we are thrilled to welcome you as our new President, and we offer you our warmest felicitations on the special day of your investiture. Presidential investitures are rare at Montclair. This is only the ninth one in 114 years. However, they are always an important celebration of renewal and a wonderful opportunity for us to reaffirm our commitment to the future of this great university. Today, the value of Montclair as a public serving university is more important than ever. We are fortunate indeed to welcome a president who has such a compelling vision of the critical role they play in public service and community engagement. I chaired the presidential search committee and I remember vividly the first time I met Jonathan. He was just one small square on a Zoom screen with other members of the search committee. But I must say, he made an immediate impression on me with his energy and his passion for the role Montclair State could play. From the start, Jonathan stood out from a strong candidate pool, not only for his charisma and his drive, but also for how he engaged us in a vigorous, and constructive dialogue. Later in the search process, when Jonathan met the trustees in person, we were unanimous in our opinion that he would be the kind of transformative president we needed at this propitious time. Undoubtedly, in the mold of previous transformative presidents, who have expanded and enhanced Montclair, making it the thriving research university we see today. I must say, our collective judgment has been amply borne out by the profile President Capel already enjoys after his inaugural year. The personal qualities that made him so notable in the search process have been widely welcomed by the university community. For example, he's been popping up all over the place, meeting students, faculty and staff, visiting labs, classrooms, and visiting performing spaces, attending lectures and performances, and indeed athletic contests, where he is a very passionate supporter of our Red Hawks. Jonathan has also been active beyond our campus, forming partnerships with corporate and community leaders advocating in Trenton for more resources for our students and working to make Montclair more noticeable on the national stage. We have seen a strong start to realizing the three pillars of his vision for the university, namely public service, community engagement, and of course student success. 
He has championed our identity as a public serving institution and created new opportunities for students to engage in public service. He has reinforced our long-standing ties with Newark while also building a closer relationship with Patterson. And he's engaged New Jersey's community colleges and formed a relationship with Bloomfield College, an initiative that holds great promise for the students and communities both institutions serve. He brings many good ideas from Arizona State University to shape the future of Montclair, to further enhance the success of our students, create more opportunities for them, and broaden the university's reach and impact. And you know, this is just the beginning of what I know will be an outstanding presidency. Coming up next, is our video presentation, Soaring into the Future. After the video, we will hear from representatives of the many communities that comprise the university. Later in the program, two leaders in higher education who know President Capel will deliver keynote speeches. So please enjoy the video. Looking to the future. We're spreading our wings. And now, more than ever, we are going to soar. It's a new era at Montclair State University. Under new leadership, with a deep commitment to our enduring mission of expanding opportunity, changing lives, and transforming communities, which all began at the turn of the 20th century. New Jersey had just one school to prepare teachers. Not nearly enough to meet the growing demand for public education in the state. So a new school was planned right here in Montclair Heights. And in September 1908, 187 pupils filed into its only building, College Hall, created by nine faculty members and a principal. Over time, under the leadership of eight former presidents, diverse in ethnicity and gender, the small teacher's college evolved into a thriving state university. The second largest and fastest growing in New Jersey. With 78 buildings on 252 acres and 5.3 million square feet of space in which to learn and grow. And through the turbulent decades of the 20th and 21st centuries, the mission never wavered. Today, Montclair State University is recognized for excellence. We are a leader in the field of education with respected faculty and world-class facilities. A public research doctoral university making breakthroughs with local and global impact. Solving issues in science, mathematics, education, business, communications, humanities, nursing, and more. And from that first class of 187, we've grown into a student body that's 21,000 strong, supported by an alumni community of more than 140,000. As students, we are hardworking and ambitious, with many of us juggling multiple jobs to put ourselves through school. More than one third of us are the first in our family to attend college. Collectively, we are studying the more than 300 doctoral, master's, and bachelor's degree programs across 10 colleges and schools. What began in response to the need for more public school teachers is now a diverse, dynamic university. Influencing the future of the state and the nation.
our graduates have become CEOs and senior officers of businesses such as Bristol Myers Squibb, Fidelity Financial, U.S. Steel, Coca-Cola. Invented and built the largest radio telescope in the world. Became the first African-American teachers in New Jersey schools. Mayors and legislators. University presidents and judges. Scientists and health professionals. Broadway stars. And even sang with the Metropolitan Opera. And under the leadership of our ninth president, we are soaring even higher. Becoming educators. Sharing our love of learning. Red Hawks performing greater community service. Employees and entrepreneurs striving to solve the world's problems. Promoting sustainability science. Making our neighborhoods stronger. Our energy and water cleaner. Our world greener. Positioning our graduates for success. the chance to pursue an education, fulfill one's potential, realize dreams and aspirations is for everyone. And as we soar into our future, Montclair State University remains committed to our enduring mission of sharing knowledge and ideas with tolerance and openness to a diverse community. Creating opportunities for students to learn and grow through public service, improving the well-being of communities on this campus and beyond becoming New Jersey's premier public service university, sending out citizens of the world, striving to make it a better place. Watch, Watch us soar! Please welcome our student representative, Richard Steiner Otu, President of the Student Government Association and member of the Class of 2024. Richard is majoring in Geography, Environmental and Urban Studies and minoring in Political Science. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, President Coppell, for inviting me to share remarks as a representative of our students uh, here at Montclair State University, so thank you. It's my administration's goal to grow student involvement on campus as we transition out of the COVID-19 pandemic to assist low-income income students with food insecurities, build cultural competency around campus, and make all of our students feel like they are welcome here on campus. This is why I'm so excited to work alongside a president who shares so many goals to help make higher education more affordable and accessible. A president who is also willing to hear the concerns of students and not only listen, but take those concerns and turn them into active change. When I first saw Dr. Capel, he didn't actually know that I was in the room. It was the day of his hiring, it was the day that it was announced, and he had come to our campus to introduce himself and tell us about his vision for our campus community. I was one of the small number of students in the room. When he spoke about what he wanted to see our campus become, I immediately became excited for him to join our campus community here at Montclair. And today, I'm even more excited to formally welcome this amazing new leader to our campus. As an African-American student who has been elected as to represent our entire student population. I think that it's important to acknowledge, acknowledge the great strides our university has taken to grow and become a home away from home for many students. We are a minority serving institution and a his Hispanic serving institution, and we have many programs in place to assist minority students, uh, to assist low, excuse me, to assist my, to assist minority and low income students such as the Equal Opportunity Fund, which helps students with low income fam from low income families and helps them reach their potential, in addition to the Lewis Stokes Alliance for the Minority, uh, minority Student Participation, which opens pathways in STEM 
for fields in minor for minority students. I participate in both programs and take great pride in this and the many opportunities that this, op that this university offers for minority students. I am so excited to continue to build those programs in the future alongside our new president. And on behalf of our entire student population, as a representative, I would like to welcome you to our campus community and just say that we are all very excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sandra Collins, professor of psychology representing the faculty. Warm greetings, dear colleagues and students. I have two minutes to share my observation of our president during his first year. To our advantage as faculty, I would say that we have a president who has never left his roots as a faculty member. He is engaged in the intellectual life of the university and is truly interested in hearing about faculty research and scholarship. Quite a few of you can testify that he's been out meeting with as many faculty members as he possibly can. And I, I can honestly say that I'm impressed that he does not forget who you are, and when he finds information that might be relevant to your research, he's, he will pass it on. He has been open and excited about coming into the classroom or attending faculty-sponsored programs. I invited him to share some comments on his favorite, most influential black figure for about five minutes, three more than they gave me today. <laughs> I gave him some extra time because he was the president, and this was during the opening day for Black History Month. He started giving an in-depth presentation on Frederick Douglass, like an impassioned faculty presenting his most recent research, and he kept talking and talking, and talking, and talking. Well, if you've been to any of his town, town halls, you know he can talk it. <laughs> I hope I still have my job after. Look, family, <laughs> we got family testimony, y'all. <laughs> uh, he was given five minutes. About 15 minutes later, I realized he knew more about Frederick Douglass than, than I did, and maybe even more more than most black folks, so I thought maybe he better break out his family album so I could check out his lineage. <laughs> it became clear to me that he was an authority on Frederick Douglass, and he has continued to share Frederick Douglass facts with me ever since. And uh, I'm going to give him a Frederick Douglass bookmark from, 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 from the faculty. On the serious side, I would describe him as a faculty member at heart, and I would advise you to give him extra time if you invite him to your class or to a program. Now, on another note, I would have to tell you that President Capel brings to Montclair State University a talent that no other college university in the state of New Jersey has. Listen to me. He is a disc jockey <laughs> on the down low. He has displayed his talent spinning his vinyl 45 records at our own radio station, WMSC, where he established a reputation, listen now, as Dr. K, doctor of funkology. <laughs> and listen, I, I couldn't even describe the outfit that he had on, not that uptight. <laughs> You know, his, his daughter know what I'm talking about. I was trying to find a shirt. I couldn't find one, but not that uptight power suit that we're normally used to seeing him in. But during the, uh, his presentation there, when his university president job was mentioned, this jockey, Jonathan Kay, is quoted as saying, that's sort of a side gig. I only do that to keep the lights on so I can spin vinyl. <laughs> that's what I'm really about. And, I, you know, I'm an honest person. I'm talking to my colleagues. He, he's proven to be quite a talented disc jockey, and I must admit, he has skills at dropping a beat. Now, to make sure that he is properly 
uh, prepared to lead this university in the music industry, I give him this 45 vinyl record, Leather and Lace by Stevie Nicks with Don Henley, and this honorary microphone. <laughs> Microphone. So if you have 45 hit records from the 60s or 70s, don't throw them away. Give them to Dr. Jonathan, Dr. of Funkology. So dear colleagues, you can invite President Capel to your class, and he will respond like a full-fledged faculty, or you can invite him to your party to drop a few tunes. On a more serious note, Dr. Uh, Capel, on behalf of the faculty, we are glad you're here at the university. Your vision is ambitious and inspiring, and we look forward to working with you to help achieve it. Please welcome Priya Sanazi, Assistant Director of Building Services in our Facilities Department, who is representing staff today. Hello, President Kopal. I'm so honored that you asked me to represent the staff here today. I will never forget the first time I met you. It was last September when Tropical Storm Ida came and dumped a lot of rain on our campus. It was a very bad storm. Many buildings got water in them, and the facilities team was working really hard to get them ready for opening the following day. You had only started your job one month before, but you interrupted your busy schedule to come over to the Panzer Athletic Center and talk to us. It meant a lot to me and my colleagues. You were so gracious and kind, and you even took some pictures for your Twitter. And when you posted them, you thanked us by name. I remember you said something in your tweet like, this floor is so clean, I would eat off it. <laughs> then the second time I met you, it was a 9-11 day of service, and you stopped to take a picture with me and my grandchildren. They were so impressed. The president knew grandma's name. And we love supporting our students and our professors. And for me personally, I am very proud that my daughter has earned three degrees here from our university, including her master's in nursing. Thank you. And she's also an adjunct professor here. Many employees send their children here because we know that they will have a great experience and become well prepared to be successful in life. We know how important this university is for the students. They are getting a very good education at a lower price than many other universities. We have excellent professors. We have excellent facilities. We have excellent services for the students. And we have excellent staff members that truly care. I have listened to you talk about your vision, and I find it to be most inspiring. You have a vision that Montclair can do many things to make a wor the world a better place. And you inspire our students to imagine a better future for all of humanity, and then to go and create it. It reminds me of what Mahatma Gandhi said, you must be the change you wish to see in the future, in the world. Sorry. President Coppell, you have a very big job to do. And it is not an easy job, I am sure. We appreciate you coming here to give us leadership. 
I know you will do great things for our university. I want you to know that you can count on the staff of this university. We are proud to be Red Hawks. We wish you much success. Please welcome to the podium Patterson Mayor Andre Seya, who is working closely with President Coppell to further extend the partnerships between his city and the university. I'm fully aware and completely appreciate Dr. Jonathan Funkology, I'm sorry, Coppell's, I couldn't resist, I'm sorry commitment to public service. In fact, that focus on community solutions and good government runs in his family, especially with his father. And in full disclosure, the real reason why I'm here is to make sure that Dr. Coppell is formally installed so that he doesn't move to Patterson and run against me for mayor in that city. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he's visited Patterson frequently, and I don't know if you know this, doctor, but many people have taken to calling you Keanu Reeves because of the fact that he bears a resemblance to the actor. So I'll make it a point to take a selfie with you and let them know I met Keanu Reeves today at Montclair State University. And by the time Dr. Coppell is finished, MSU will stand for, of course, Matrix State University. So I'm honored to be here on behalf of the most diverse city here in the state of New Jersey, Patterson, where Alexander Hamilton set the stage, home of the Great Falls, great food, and a great future. And that's what I envision with our new leader here at Montclair State University. There are many opportunities for the two of us to collaborate. And when I first met you, that is what stood out. Your passion for partnerships. And if this pandemic has taught us anything, we are not alone in this world, and we have to collaborate in the best interest of the people that we serve. And that opportunity also lies at Hinchliffe Stadium, which we are restoring. One of only two stadiums still standing in this country that hosted Negro League games. And Dr. Coppell, has stepped forward and said, if you're trying to write a success story in the city of Patterson, sign me up as a co-author. And so that new narrative will be at Hinchliffe Stadium. And Montclair State will help us tell the story of African Americans who were excluded from playing in Major League Baseball. <laughs> Dr. Jonathan Coppell will serve as a co-author of that new narrative so that we could tell the story of social justice and civil rights that took place on a baseball field in the city of Patterson. Dr. Coppell will also help us write a new narrative when it comes to the Great Falls and the potential of having a campus, a satellite campus, in the city of Patterson. No pressure there, doctor. <laughs> and as the board president stated earlier, enhancing the image and reputation, the national recognition of Montclair State University. There's a crisis in this country, a teacher shortage, and we've had discussions of potentially placing a Montclair State Teachers Academy in the city of Patterson so that we can address a national crisis and have Pattersonians become classroom teachers to serve as inspiration for future generations in this country. And so, doctor, I consider you a partner and a friend. I just hope that we're still friends after my New York Mets defeat New York, your New York Yankees in the World Series. Hey, we're Mets fans. We have an inferiority complex. I had to get that one in. And so, Dr. Coppell, I wish you success in this upcoming endeavor. I know that you are up to the task. And MSU is fortunate to have an enlightened and visionary leader in you. And so I thank you for making MSU your matrix. Thank you.
Please welcome New Jersey Assemblywoman Brittany Timberlake. She has served New Jersey's 34th district, which includes Montclair, since 2018. Hello. This is such an amazing event. I love the way that you began with the students, and now we're here with the faculty. And it's so great to see so many familiar faces, familiar faces that symbolize educating the future, always. I see a great friend, president of Kane University, Lamont Repolette. I see Chancellor Nancy Cantor here of Rutgers, Newark, um, and so many others. I'll get in trouble if I start naming names, right? Um, but we're here at the investiture, which I've been to inaugurations. I've been to where people are being ordained. And uh, President Kopal said, but investiture is the right word. And I said, well, I guess it is. And when I was thinking of the word investiture, the number one thing you hear is invest. And what we're doing today is investing into the future of this institution and the students and the lives that you touch every single day. Now, President Kopal, I know that you'll be able to tell me what the name of this is. I don't know the formal name of it. I'll call it a baton. It's amazing. <laughs> and we're also symbolizing the passing of the baton or the mace, as President Kopal just whispered to me, <laughs> from this amazing woman who deserves a round of applause, <laughs> President Susan Cole. I admire Susan Cole for so many reasons, um, but and she may or may not know this reason that I'm getting ready to say, but she speaks truth to power she stands firm in her heels, and she says it like it is as she gets things done. That's certainly something that I can relate to and draw inspiration from, because when men do it, they're, they're regarded as something, and when women do it, we're regarded as something else. But today you pass the mace to President Kopal, who is going to lead us into the future, and I'm so excited about that. We've been able at the state of New Jersey to invest in Montclair State and your success through different um, funding opportunities and things, and we look forward to continuing to invest in uh, this institution as President Kopal lead us there. We know that today is a good investment here at this investiture. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Roger Leon, the superintendent of Newark Public Schools and a 1996 graduate of Montclair State University. Good afternoon, President Capel, Board of Trustees, fellow alumni, student body, faculty and staff, elected leaders, and honored guests. I am a member of the class of 96, and it's really nice to be back home. I am proud to be an alumnus of this great institution, which gave me my foundation as a leader. I received a fine education from professors who were among the best in their fields and who took personal interest in my success. They challenged me to stretch and to grow, and they stressed the importance of using one's education to make a difference in the world. Over the years, I have heard from many fellow Red Hawks who have had a very similar experience. The faculty and staff are truly focused on student success and on behalf of all of the alumni, I say thank you. Dr. Capel and I share something in common. 
uh, we were both high school debaters. He participated in Lincoln Douglas debate for Bronx High School of Science, and I was a policy debater for Newark Science. In fact, I am pretty sure we were in the same buildings at the same time at various debate events around the country, but we never met. If you don't know the difference between these two traditions of debate, allow me to explain. In policy debating, which I did, you have to cover a lot of ground in a very short period of time. You learn to, take your, you learn to make your point quickly and without extra words. On the other hand, in Lincoln-Douglas debate, which Jonathan did, you do not have much to say, but you do have a lot of time to say it. So you learn to talk and talk and talk. And I think that explains a lot about President Kopech. Seriously, though, as high school debaters, Jonathan and I both benefited from being the students of two great educators, Richard B. Sadako for him and Brent Ferrand for me. These incredible teachers worked hard to integrate the debate community. They recruited and welcomed students of color, women, and youngsters from lower income families to an activity that had once been largely reserved for white males from privileged backgrounds. Sadako and Ferrand expected excellence from every child and adult, regardless of their background, and they produced many champions. As their students, we thrived in an integrated learning community where excellence was expected, and now as institutional leaders, that experience inspires us to expand our learning communities and to demand excellence for our students and from our students. In high school, we learned what it meant to have a great teacher. And that's a big reason why we are both so passionate about the vibrant partnership that has developed between this university and my school system. It's a reciprocal relationship that helps each institution carry out its mission. And most important, helps make it possible for my district to deliver an outstanding education to the young people of Newark. Your professors educate and support our teachers and school leaders. And in turn, our teachers and school leaders are role models for your students, welcoming into our buildings so that they can see firsthand what an inclusive, excellent educational environment looks like. Together, we are renewing education, discovering and sharing best practices, overcoming challenges, and preparing the next generation of inspiring teachers and transformative school leaders. Among the, among the many programs and initiatives that we are doing together, one of the most exciting is the Red Hawks Rising Teacher Academy. In this innovative dual, yes. In this innovative dual enrollment program, our high school students who aspire to become educators take college level teacher preparation courses at Montclair and when they complete their university education, they are offered jobs in our schools. This incredible initiative between the district, Montclair State University and the American Federation of Teachers has received national acclaim from the United States Department of Education, which promotes it as a model teacher preparation program for the entire nation. The Red Hawks Rising Teacher Academy is helping solve the chronic shortage of teachers for urban schools, especially teachers of color and it is creating career opportunities for young people in my city. Thank you, Montclair, for being our partner in this important work. President Capel embraces our partnership because he is truly an educator at heart. In the mold of our great debate coaches, who were fierce champions for diversity 
and inclusion, and who held us to high standards so that we could become our very best selves. And so I say to the students, faculty, and alumni of Montclair State University, welcome to the continued expansion of your community as a place where all are welcomed and a place where educational excellence is the only acceptable outcome. Congratulations, President Capel, and best wishes. And now, please turn your attention to the video screens for a message from New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. Hello, everybody. Governor Phil Murphy here virtually to join with the entire Montclair State community in celebration of the installation of Jonathan Coppell as the university's ninth president. I'm wearing my red and white, and I sure wish I were there in person. Over the past year, as I've had the privilege of getting to know Jonathan, I have been incredibly impressed with his passion, outstanding leadership, and his vision for the future of Montclair State University. Throughout its 113-year history, Montclair State has become an important resource for the state of New Jersey and beyond, providing a strong education for its students, the opportunity for social and economic mobility, and promoting the ideals of public service. And I am confident that President Coppell is the right person to lead Montclair State in this moment and to continue its upward trajectory. I look forward to seeing MSU grow under Jonathan's leadership and wish you all the very best for a successful tenure. Congratulations, everybody. It is indeed a pleasure to present to you the Montclair State University singers as they perform How Can I Keep From Singing, arranged by Gwyneth Walker and conducted by Heather J. Buchanan. Can I, 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 can I,
Please welcome Preston D. Pinkett III to the podium, a member of the Board of Trustees who has served for the last 20 years. Um, first, let me start by saying that was incredible, um, and give them another round of applause. And uh, the Wind Symphony wasn't bad when we walked in, so I'd like to give them a round of applause because they will be leaving. Now, as Brittany said, I've never been to an investor before. I did not know it was a roast, um, but that's not, what I, that's not why I'm here. It is, it, is, it is my honor to introduce our keynote speakers. I don't know about the other speakers. They're all pretty good to me, but um, we, will, we will hear from Felix V. Matos Rodriguez, uh, the first educator of color and Latino to become Chancellor of the City University of New York, the nation's largest urban public university. Now, I know we talk about how we're the second largest, fastest growing, and we graduate close to 20,000 students. They have 243,000 degree-seeking students and 185,000 continuing education students in 25 campuses. So Patterson might not be out of the way. <laughs> Chancellor Matos Rodriguez's career spans both academic, academia and government and includes serving as president of a community college, four-year institution, and as a cabinet secretary for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. He will be followed by Marquita Evans, uh, president of Bloomfield College, New Jersey's only four-year predominantly black institution. President Evans is the first woman and African-American to be named president of Bloomfield College in its 151-year history. She <laughs> She has been an award-winning transformational leader in higher education for more than 30 years. At both public and private institutions, the majority of which are minority-serving institutions. She has worked with President Capel to develop a strategic relationship between the two institutions, which could serve as a national model of innovation. Please welcome to the podium Chancellor Marcos Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and greetings, everyone. Let me start by saying that I come in peace from the other side of the river, right? <laughs> There's no need to be concerned. But uh, seriously, I am deeply honored to be here to help mark the investiture of my colleague and my dear friend, Jonathan Coppell, as the ninth president of Montclair State University. Thank you to all who are here with us here today and to all of those who have helped to make today's festivities so very meaningful and memorable. Welcome to Chairman Cuss and the other members of the Board of Trustees. And hello to Bloomfield College President Marcetta Evans. And uh, a big shout out to all of our elected officials who have preceded me here today in the days. I felt a little bit funny when I thought I was out of place listening to Met and Yankees jokes. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm happy to be here. I acknowledge the president of the Student Government Association, Richard Steiner Otto, and yes, you can give this to me. And Maria Cavero Munoz, the voting student on the Board of Trustees, and to all of Montclair students, faculty, and staff, greetings and saludos to all of you. As the representative of the City University of New York, which shares Montclair's commitment to a high quality, affordable public education, I think I can fully appreciate how this inauguration fittingly encapsulates the history and the ethos of both institutions. When City College was founded in 1785, 175 years ago, its core position that higher education should be available to everyone, not only to those of wealth and status, was quite radical. It was, however, a mission that proved not just ethically sound, but also a tenet that was essential to the development of New York City, and in fact, to this country. Q 
CUNY's example inspired the development of a series of accessible institutions, from land-grant universities to normal schools like Montclair, that train teachers to support a robust system of K-12 public education. Those, in turn, became core engines of social mobility and essential to the idea of the American dream. Not only were individual lives transformed by expanded access to higher education, the trajectories of entire families were altered as the children of laborers, peddlers, and faculty workers were now on pathways to prosperous careers, and their children go on to pursue graduate degrees in law, medicine, or business. If you want a prime example of this intergenerational arc, look no further than Jonathan's own family. His grandmother, Elsie Cobstein Sunshine, the daughter of a shoemaker, graduated from Hunter College to become a special education teacher in Brooklyn. Elsie's two brothers, George and Arthur Kopstein, graduated from City College. They served in World War II and went on to have long careers with the Postal Service, just like so many first-generation graduates climbing the ladder to the middle class. And I proudly note that all three of them attended colleges that were part of what would later become the City University of New York. Ah, the next generation. Elsie and her husband, Simon, a jeweler, had two daughters, including Jonathan's mother, Kathleen Sunshine, who earned PhDs, both of them. And their baby brother eventually found his way also to higher education as a high-ranking administrator at John Hopkins at Northwestern. As the former president of Queens College, I take particular pride in the fact that Kathleen's journey included graduating from Queens before she went on to earn her doctorate in English literature at Harvard. Now, since I'm only talking about Jonathan's family, I should say that his father, Oliver Coppell, the son of immigrants who served as New York State Attorney General, Assembly Member, and New York City Council Member, he did not go to CUNY. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, right? But. But he still owes a debt of gratitude to us because his wife is also a Queens College graduate. The debt is mutual, as Jonathan's dad was honored by Baruch College for his leadership as a city council member and his steady support for students, particularly students with disability. And I had the honor to go lobby him for funding when I was a community college president in the South Bronx. And he was very generous. That was a long way of saying that even though Jonathan never attended CUNY or a public university, his family's history embodies a lot of what makes CUNY and Montclair State special. Jonathan's family story is the story of the promise of America and the role of public higher education plays in that promise. I see it every day at CUNY. I've seen it in my own family. Like Jonathan's grandmother, my abuela, Margarita Castro, did not have a head start in life. Growing up poor in rural Puerto Rico, she had to help her mother work as a seamstress. But despite the prejudice and the toil, she found a way to go to a public school. Eventually, she attended the University of Puerto Rico through a similar normal school program and she became a public school English teacher for 40 years. And her son, my father, Felix the original, became an engineer who also graduated from the University of Puerto Rico. That is the journey that we have keep seeing in America thanks to places like the one where we stand right now. Almost half of the incoming class in Montclair State are the first in their families to attend college? What stories would their grandchildren tell? We can only imagine. But isn't it wonderful? Isn't it special 
that we all are here to play a part in making those stories possible. That is why we must keep dream alive. And I know that that is one of the main drivers in Jonathan's commitment to public higher education. It resonated with me personally when Jonathan talked about his desire to make his career at a public institution. I can attest that he's very proud of that, thanks to the opportunities enjoyed by his parents and grandparents and their hard work. He was afforded even more opportunities, and now, as a result, he finds himself in a position to help open doors for countless more. In fact, Jonathan has already more than proved his commitment to putting his experience to work in the betterment of affordable public higher education. As the Dean of Arizona State University's Watts College, Jonathan led the nation's largest comprehensive public affairs college to attain the highest rank programs at the university. He also led Watts, which was a majority minority institution and counted more than 60% of his students who qualify for a federal Pell Grant to significantly improve his students' retention and graduation rates through innovative counseling and student support initiatives. The vision and experience that Jonathan brings are a perfect match for Montclair State University. He does have some big shoes to fill. For 23 years, his predecessor, Dr. Susan Cole, the first woman to serve as president of Montclair, worked to greatly expand and transform the institution. Please give a big shout out to President Cole. And because he also knows that the role of the presidency is a relay, I also want to acknowledge the presence here of Dr. Irving Reed, who led Montclair State from 1899, from 1899 to 1997, my bad, a period that includes his move to become a university staff. He became younger. And as you, if you were in the ceremony before and you saw his cartoon, later left to be president at Wayne State uh, University, becoming the first African-American leader of that institution. So thank you for your hard work and your enduring contributions also. So as you see, Jonathan does have some big shoes to fill, but I'm confident that Montclair stands in very, very good hands. In fact, I think it is safe to say that Jonathan's work here, which started last year, is already bearing fruit. The school year that just started has ushered in a record-breaking incoming class, the largest and most diverse student body in the history of Montclair. For a second consecutive year, you can give that a big round of applause. And for the second consecutive year, the newest students hail from 39 states and 21 countries. And also, I'm going to say this, as a Latino myself, right, I am also very pleased that about 41% of Montclair's incoming class identifies as Hispanic. A lot has changed since Montclair started as a normal school back in 1908. Back then, if you were paying attention to the video, there were 180 some students, a few buildings, and a principal, not even a president. Maybe the faculty would have loved that, right? But it, I, it definitely didn't have its own New Jersey transit station, right? Now, with 20, almost 22,000 students, more than it's ever had, Montclair is an institution that we can truly say is critical to the future of our region and of our country. As we emerge from the worst pandemic in a century, the challenges are many for higher education. But we've learned how to better serve our students by using technology. The period forced us to expand remote and hybrid learning modalities, making higher education more inclusive 
and making its many benefits available to a wider and increasingly diverse swath of students. That, in turn, has prompted a thorough examination of our practices and pedagogy. As we strive to meet all students where they are and position them to thrive in today's workplace. This is a position that I find myself, along with Jonathan and chancellors and presidents across the higher education landscape. We embrace the challenges that we face and those that lie ahead, constantly growing as institutions and finding new ways to prepare our students for the increasingly complex world that they will face. Jonathan is more than well prepared to join these efforts as he works to sustain and add to this university's growth and success. He has exactly the kind of vision and leadership that we need to sustain the intergenerational promise of public higher education and to make it even stronger going forward. Señor Presidente Copel, Le deseo mucha suerte y mucho éxito. I wish him lots of good luck in his future endeavors, and I look forward to learning about his success, your success, as I watch safely from the other side of the river. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pickett, Pinkett, for your introduction. And Chancellor Matos Rodriguez, you are a tough act to follow. It's such a joy to be here today to celebrate my dear friend and colleague, Jonathan Coppell, ninth president of Montclair State University. You know, I led intentionally with the word friend because that is what we are, first and foremost. Our friendship formed before our professional relationship took hold, and it is an honor to stand here today and speak about both. Now, I warned Jonathan that I was going to get personal in this speech, because to personally know Jonathan is to better understand how he approaches his presidency at Montclair State University. So about a month after Jonathan started his presidency, we met. It wasn't at an event or on a Zoom call. I strolled right over to his office with no agenda, literal or otherwise, and it was just two first-time presidents chatting and wanting to welcome him to the neighborhood. We spoke for almost over an hour, you know, and, and just talked about a variety of different things. And when I was done and heading out, Jonathan joked, wait, is that it? You don't want anything from me? Uh, he kind of had a point. You see, any leader in higher education knows people rarely come by just to say hi. I laughed and assured him, nope, I just came by to meet you. And I truly meant that. For those who don't know me, before I was president at Bloomfield College or provost at Our Lady of the Lake University or associate dean and department chair at the University of Texas at San Antonio, I was a faculty member and a counselor educator. My background in counseling instilled in me the importance of transparency, openness to collaboration, and connection. We don't get anywhere in life alone. And I immediately recognized this in Jonathan upon meeting him. He is actually one of the good ones. His friendship and professional relationship that we forged might have surprised some. I mean, we were definitely with some would probably call an unlikely pair. I, a black woman from Texas, and he, well, he's not a black woman from Texas. <laughs> Quick example, I knew Jonathan had grown up in the Bronx and absolutely loved the Jets. So not so long after we met, I invited Jonathan over to the house to watch the Jets at my home with my husband, Ed. There we were eating chicken wings and drinking beer together. He fit right in. Why? Because he belongs here. Suffice it to say, community will always matter. 
Whether you're a child beginning school, a young adult moving into your college dorm, or a higher education professional starting the next stage of your career, it is important. So when I first started in 2019 at Bloomfield College, I didn't have a local friend or a mentor in this way. So it became important to me to become that person for someone else. Because you know, not everyone knows what it's like to not only uproot your life, including at times your family for your career, but to start your first term as a president of a higher education institution, that's a whole nother story. The biggest asset Jonathan and I have in common is that our personal and professional ideals, they merge. We share what I like to call North Star passions and views because we use them to guide us through our lives and our careers. They're not separate. It's just how we operate. It is our belief system. That's why I was hardly surprised when the day came when he called me, and yes, this time he wanted something. And guess what? I needed something. For those of you who don't know, excuse me, in the fall of 2021, my institution publicly announced our financial crisis and called upon any institution who might want to explore partnering with our college. Because without a strategic partner, Bloomfield College was at great risk of closing. While I wasn't surprised by Jonathan's call, because by then I knew him, I was still a little stunned that he would even consider taking this on. As far as I'm concerned, Jonathan put his legacy on the line right at the start of his tenure. And I am and will be eternally grateful that he did. But I want to take a moment, though, to applaud his fierce decision to make bold moves at, the stage, at this stage of his career. I also want to take the time to thank the MSU Board of Trustees for the same and for appointing this visionary leader. Now, I wish to delve into why this was second nature to Jonathan. While I'm optimistic that the strategic partnership between Montclair State University and Bloomfield College will, you know, being pursued will go down in the books as a historic one, we must acknowledge that there is a really special opportunity in higher ed education that we're trying to grasp. And without going into too much detail, I will say this. The journey our two instit institutions will be examined and explored for years to come. We will be the blueprint. We are the prototype, the model. Bloomfield College, we did not hide our situation and we publicly asked for help. Publicly putting your business out in the streets, that rarely happens in higher education. And when it does, it is usually too late. The Chronicle of Higher Education let us know daily that Bloomfield College won't be the last institution to experience these challenges and other institutions will have to make a choice. I just pray they will have an institution willing to throw them a lifeline and that they will not only again have that institution but have a captain of the ship that is willing to lead and have vision to see potential synergies and benefits where others do not. Okay, back to Jonathan. He is a strong advocate for a place like Bloomfield College because the institution's core values and mission mirror his own. He believes in what we're accomplishing further down Bloomfield Avenue. He knows the life-changing power of social mobility and how minority-serving places are the vessels that hoist our students up the social mobility ladder. Without places like Bloomfield College, many of these students would, would remain excluded from opportunities because they would not have access to a degree. Jonathan knows that. These are not just buzzwords to him. Social justice runs through his veins. He puts his intent into action every single day and promotes public service. He is a community person and one who consistently uplifts underrepresented communities. As far as I'm concerned, Jonathan, he could have gone anywhere, but he chose to come to MSU, a Hispanic serving institution. He did not have to call me that day, only a few months into his presidency. He could have remained a supportive friend 
and I would have looked at him just the same, but he picked up the phone and he made that call. Now we are both a part of this historic opportunity that may have forever changed how smaller and bigger institutions view one another and operate together. Current and future leaders in this room today, I'm here to caution and encourage. Don't wait until it's too late. We are not in competition. We are a collective and we must come together when it matters the most for the greater good. As stated earlier, Bloomfield College isn't alone. Many small private liberal, and liberal arts colleges in the Northeast and across the country have been facing similar challenges and may arrive at a similar crossroad. I often ask myself with a smile, what would Jonathan do? If you can emulate anyone's leadership style, be a Jonathan. We must uplift and support one another. We can change the face of higher education and we can change the game. Be a Jonathan and thank you and congratulations my friend on this very, very special day. And now, for the official investiture of President Coppell, please welcome Montclair State University trustee, Mary Comito. Good afternoon. So, are we, are we ready to do this? We've now come to the part of the ceremony where the Board of Trustees symbolically invests the President with the authority and responsibility of his office. This is an ancient tradition in universities, a tradition that derives from the founding in medieval times. It may seem a little silly here in 2022 that we are wearing velvet robes and floppy hats and that our Grand Marshal carries a mace. <laughs> which was originally a weapon of war, that we are now about to place a metal chain around the president's neck. For real. <laughs> Yet there is a serious purpose underlying all the symbolism here. For one thing, we are honoring the important role that universities have played in the development of human potential for more than a thousand years. And we are expressing our hope that these institutions, which are dedicated to the discovery and transmission of knowledge and to the betterment of society, will continue for another millennium or more. In a few minutes, we will bestow the medallion on President Capel. The trustees of the university will enact in front of all the members of the university community our most important role. As trustees, we are volunteer members of the public who hold the university in trust for the next generation. We are stewards of this great institution, looking out for its welfare so that it can continue to carry out its mission for the benefit of future generations. As public stewards, it is our responsibility to care for the university and to leave it better than we found it. Our job includes setting policy, overseeing financial and operational matters, and asking hard questions, and serving as a sounding board for the institution's leadership all in the service of the public good. Among these important duties, the most important is the selection of a president. In choosing the president, the board delegates its authority and responsibility, and now to symbolically make the delegation of power to President Capel we will present him with a chain of office and medallion. These objects 
symbolize the authority held by the Board of Trustees on behalf of the university. When the trustees place the medallion around the president's neck, we will symbolically invest him with the authority of his office and signify the confidence that the board has in his ability to carry out the duties of the presidency. Now, to formally bestow the medallion on President Capel, I ask my fellow trustee, Preston Prinker, and student trustee Maria Cavero Munoz to step up, please. President Capel, would you please join them? Jonathan G. S. Capel, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I pronounce you formally invested in the office of the President of Montclair State University. May. Yep. Oh, your name. Okay. Thank you so much. Let me, let me begin by expressing my heartfelt feelings at the incredibly generous words you were all subjected to just now. I mean, it, it, really, is, um, it really is somewhat overwhelming. Um, it's been an incredible 12 months, an incredibly warm reception um, from day one. And I am incredibly grateful for the confidence that all of you uh, have so foolishly placed in me. <laughs> of course, the biggest thank you does go to the Board of Trustees who have a very weighty responsibility on behalf of the people of New Jersey, uh, as, as Mary said, and uh, I, take that, I take that delegation quite seriously. The passion for this university is as abundant as it is obvious, so the trust that has been placed in me is both humbling and motivating. The whole Montclair State University community, students, faculty, staff, alumni, members of the general community, all have offered me full support from the very beginning. That starts with the people right around me in the president's office, Keith, Karen, Pam, Tim, especially Lillian, who I see at the end of the day uh, as she's ready to make my office clean, if not neat, that's my problem. Uh, it extends to our incredible deans and vice presidents uh, who have uh, gotten right on board with the agenda that, that we've established. Uh, the University Senate, extremely enthusiastic, responsive. Our union leaders who are ready to form a constructive, collaborative partnership to do great things at this university. And let me, let me say, it extends to the whole community of higher education in New Jersey. I want to recognize my colleagues here today. Thank you so much for being here, but thank you so much for the welcome that you gave to me. Uh, we, really are, we really are fortunate in this state to have such a, a collaborative ecosystem, uh, and we're going to do great things together. All kinds of universities, public, private, four-year community colleges. I have to, of course, recognize my family uh, you've heard a little bit about them. I tell a lot of people that I'm an incredibly unoriginal person. I basically averaged my parents. Uh, one, was a, one was a professor, one was a politician. I became a professor of political science. Uh, there's some truth to that. Uh, although, and as I'll talk about it, I think that what, what really inspired me was the idea that you could use a university to accomplish a lot of the things that we're trying to do in public service. I also want to recognize my father. Uh, the chancellor made reference to his strange Queens College fetish. Um, but I want to recognize uh, my stepmother, Lorraine, who's been a part of our family for 40 years and has uh, been an indispensable rock for us all. So thank you. And my sisters, my sisters, Carla and Jacqueline, who are here today, uh, who are indispensable resources to complain about the people I just was talking about. 
uh, I can't go further without uh, acknowledging my wife, uh, Jennifer Steen. By the way, uh, Chancellor, she is a sixth generation graduate of the University of California, where I met her, a public university which I'm proud to call my alma mater. Jennifer and I, I was reflecting on this. Uh, Jennifer and I, in our journey since graduate school, uh, we were Fulbright professors together in China. And a story that stood out to me was we found ourselves, perhaps owing to our less than awesome Mandarin skills, uh, we found ourselves changing flights uh, and realized that we were on a city to uh, on a flight to a city we had never heard of. It's not good. Um, we together divided and conquered. We ran back. We got our luggage back. We changed in the ticket. We bought new tickets. And entirely conducted uh, all transactions. Entirely conducted in uh, Potonghua. Uh, we knew from that moment that we could get through anything together uh, if we work together as a team uh, and we have done so uh, uh, including getting through our children Elsa and William who are here today and we've survived that so far. I also was reflecting on those who are not here. So I want to talk about it in two categories. So one, um, a lot of people influenced a lot of people influenced me uh, who are no longer with us. And those those faces, those people are flashing through my mind. And I just want to I just want to acknowledge that. Obviously, including my grandparents, who were mentioned, who had a profound influence on me, and so many others who helped me along the way, including teachers, to Roger's, uh, to Roger's point. I'll come back to that. Um, but that's actually not the main thing. What I, wanted to, what I wanted to acknowledge was all of the people who actually did all the things that you just heard I did. I, th I, had, I had a part in it, fine. But I'm only standing here and only can point to those accomplishments because I've been joined on this journey by fantastic people who are committed to doing great things that's what makes it possible to dream the dreams that I have and we all have for Montclair State University. So I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I want to give a round of applause to all those people. <laughs> okay. So you might ask uh, a question about today's festivities. Why exactly do we need to do all this? Was this guy even actually president for the last year? The short answer is, I think so. Um, although this removes any doubt, it does mean that every mistake and misstep that occurred before this ceremony, none of them count. That was all preseason, <laughs> not part of my career statistics. Seriously, the, the symbolism of this marker of office, I think, speaks to the purpose of this gathering, and it's been alluded to already because nobody can miss out on a good metaphor. Um, I am a link in the chain of leaders who served as stewards for Montclair State University and being presented today uh, by Presidents Cole and Reed who as we have heard have played defining roles in the evolution of this institution means so much. Thank you both for welcoming me to this very exclusive club. But both of them would tell you that the real star of the show today is Montclair State University. This ceremony is a celebration of a vital institution that has been ambitious and pugnacious, confident, and sometimes underestimated, uh, but always focused on its public purpose. Today is a celebration of our power to do great things when we work collectively, remembering that our destinies are intertwined. So really, all of us, all of us are links in a chain a chain that connects the people who for generations have made this university great. But most of all, what I see today as, and this is what I want to focus on, I see today as a celebration of imagination. This extraordinary human ability to form mental images of things that do not exist, that have never existed, is unique in the animal kingdom. It is our key advantage and the root of all progress. We can describe these visions, share them with others, and then draw upon knowledge and understanding accumulated across generations to make real that which has never been. To take something as ethereal as an idea 
and transform it into something as concrete as this building. Wizard of Oz author Frank Baum, who knew something about imagination, said that dreams, dreams with your eyes wide open and your brain machinery whizzing are likely to lead to the betterment of the world. The imaginative child, he said, will become the imaginative man or woman, most apt to create, to invent, and therefore to foster civilization. Ah, but how do you cultivate the creativity of the child? and empower her to take a conjured vision and mold it into something buildable, replicable, usable. At their best, universities are places where people answer this question, where people learn to harness the power of their imagination. Progress in every discipline, every discipline is ultimately driven by applied imagination. Long before we possessed microscopes with the power to see bacteria, Scientists imagined that there must be something not visible to the naked eye transmitting disease. And their successors surmised that cells contain the information that guides physiology, leading ultimately to the discovery of DNA, RNA, and the building blocks of genetics. Fortunately, this audacious imaginativeness was cultivated at universities for it ultimately led to the incredibly rapid development of COVID vaccines that allow us to be here today together. Yes, universities are living, breathing monuments to the power of human creativity. And even as we work to fill curricula with essential information and introduce students to problem-solving tools, we must remain true to this ideal. Now, if it sounds funny to hear an academic, and I still, after all, as uh, Professor Collins said, I'm still, after all, a faculty member, it sounds funny for me to downplay the importance of knowing stuff. So take the word of an adopted Jersey boy with street cred as a scholar. Imagination, Albert Einstein concluded, is more important than knowledge. Indeed, this very institution is a product of vivid imaginations that said universities can be quite different than the old world academies from which they descend. But that reinvention is not complete. It's never complete. Today, the need to marshal our creativity for the ongoing project is greater than ever. We're gathered at a time of great uncertainty. There's no reason to avoid that truth. Humanity faces an existential threat in climate change amidst a host of other challenges. And our ability to respond is hampered by a serious breakdown in American democracy that rightly has a significant portion of the population worried about the future of our republic. More immediate to this proceeding, the value of higher education is being questioned in an unprecedented fashion. Now, it's natural to push back uh, at this sometimes uninformed criticism that is as unfair as it is scathing. But today, let's do something different. Let's own it. The truth is, college has failed far too many people. The majority of Americans who have attended college do not actually possess a degree. And about 40% of those struggling with student debt that we've heard so much about lately, uh, lately, 40% have nothing to show for it. They're arguably worse off than if they hadn't started to begin with. So it's small wonder that some, many, are cynical about higher ed. Now, there's two ways to respond to this. We can criticize the arguments, we can point out where people are wrong, or we can take the advice of Cicero and criticize by what we create. Powerful idea. Don't respond with words, respond with action. Indeed, I imagine Montclair State University confronting all these challenges head on. I could see it so vividly in my mind. Together, we can build Montclair State University as an exemplar of a public serving university, a solutions engine firing on all cylinders to create the world we wish to inhabit. Now, I do realize that using an internal combustion engine as a metaphor, when I just talked about climate change, it's a bit off. Please bear with me. The electric vehicle just doesn't offer the same dynamic imagery. Bruce Springsteen is not singing about strapping anybody's hands around his battery. So, so let's 
picture the powerful pistons of our solutions engine, an unstoppable social mobility slingshot, a research-driven innovation generator, an energetic force multiplier, a steadfast and responsive community partner, and a sustaining pillar for democracy and public service. The proposition that college education should be available to any person, regardless of wealth, status, or privilege, was truly radical, as the Chancellor said, an enormous leap in imagination. Having Chancellor Matos, leader of the Ur Access Institution, embrace Montclair State University as CUNY's spiritual partner is so gratifying. It is why I feel privileged to be here. And as proud as I am of his description of Montclair, a majority-minority Hispanic-serving institution that's becoming inclusive while growing to record levels, the success of our students is most gratifying. Recently, we were recognized as one of the best universities in the country as measured by the extent to which our graduation rate exceeds expectations. Now, Montclair has thrived because we devote a lot of energy to helping students prepare to succeed in college. We have one of the mo most robust EOF programs in the state with hundreds of students every year getting the support they need to realize their potential. We've created and expanding programs to reach students before college even begins and we'll try to reach future Red Hawks and their families even earlier if we can. The point, however, is this. To build a real social mobility slingshot in the 21st century, we have to get beyond the minimum question of who is allowed to enter the hallowed halls of our great institutions of learning. We have to even get beyond teaching others how to overcome the challenges in succeeding in college. Why not push ourselves to remove the obstacles? Let's get rid of the hidden prerequisites that emerge as stumbling blocks. Let's reevaluate everything, how we operate, how we offer degrees, how we organize ourselves, everything, with an eye toward creating a better environment for student success. That includes launching this year an Office of Student Belonging and doing a comprehensive climate camp a campus climate survey as a step toward building a more equitable community for students, staff, and faculty. It, it means leveling the playing field of student experience so that life-altering opportunities like study abroad or internships are not off limits to anyone. That is a matter of money, uh, and we have put more resources into these areas and welcome more. Uh, but it's structural as well. Consider that the typical semester-long program uh, for an international experience is just not viable for those who are caregivers or primary breadwinners. So we're shaking up the conventional approaches and we will continue to do so. But this is really just the beginning. How do we reinvent higher education to take advantage of the changes in technology, the ways people learn and interact, the very things we learned about during COVID. Our Montclair Unbound initiative will answer this question. Through Montclair Unbound, we will offer degrees in ways that combine modalities, in-person, asynchronous online, real-time, distance interaction, to meet students where they want to learn. This will require significant adaptation on our part. I don't want to downplay that. But I'm so confident in the staff and faculty of Montclair State University and their devotion to our purpose. And we will invest in their growth and development so that they have the tools to succeed and they have the opportunities to advance as well. That is our mission. It is not exclusive to students. It's to everyone who's part of this community. But Montclair Unbound is, is not just a platform. It's really a mindset. And our embrace of Bloomfield College that uh, Marquita spoke about so el uh, eloquently is reflective of that mindset. I really cannot say enough about my friend and partner, Marquita Evans. I, I feel so fortunate that our paths intersected at the right moment. Bloomfield College, I agree, Bloomfield College will emerge as a critical integrated part of Montclair State of University, offering a, a differentiated learning experience, yet drawing strength from a robust research community. This is a critical step in the evolution of higher education, a new model that is student-centric, that is designed to overcome the structural impediments to success that have thwarted true access for so long. And as Dr. Evans is showing, this is not about us. It's not about our positions. It's not about our institutions. This is about putting the students and the communities we serve first. So she says, what would Jonathan do? Give me a break. <laughs> what would Marquita do? 
That's the right question. I'm going to I'm going to make you applaud for that. <laughs> so let's talk about research and scholarship for a moment. Even after the doors of some colleges opened to an increasingly diverse population of students, it was not considered plausible that such institutions might do research on a level that rivals highly selective universities. One could be excellent or accessible, not both. Public universities that have excelled as research leaders, frankly, have often done so while evolving away from an access orientation. It took a leap of imagination to say that an institution can be a driver of research excellence and innovation on par with the most elite institutions in the world while, while retaining a commitment to inclusivity. That is what Arizona State University stands for, and I feel privileged to have been a part of it for 11 years. I want to recognize several of my colleagues who are here today and also say hi to the, the viewing party that's happening in Phoenix right now. I learned so much as a part of that, and I feel so fortunate to find myself here at Montclair State University because it shares that access excellence DNA. From its earliest days, Montclair was known as a national leader. Harvard on Valley Road, it was apparently called. <laughs> you say it that way, that's the right way to say it. But it still took some imagination to envision Montclair State Teachers College joining the ranks of high research activity doctoral universities, and yet here we are with an outstanding faculty, securing more external funding every year. Indeed, one of our biggest boundary constraints is the limited space to accommodate the many projects our entrepreneurial professors are creating. But true to our public purpose, we must look beyond the conventional measure, dollars spent on research, to gauge our success. Montclair State University must be a research-driven solutions generator. This is already happening. I hope you got a chance to see some of the centers out on the, on the green earlier today. Our Center for Water Science and Technology is ensuring New Jerseyans have access to clean and healthy drinking water. Our Center on Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health is giving school districts evidence-based tools to empower neurodiverse learners. Our Center for Audiology and Speech Language Pathology is providing access to assessments and therapies. I could go on. New music, new insights, new enzymes, new ways to restore a healthy planet. This is what a research university can create. This is what we will do here. And it must be fully intertwined with the educational mission. Our fantastic, dynamic, awesome new provost, Junius Gonzalez. Please, uh, Junius. made launching a university-wide undergraduate research program one of its highest priorities, and we are making this happen this year. We will support that with more than 30 faculty searches, the largest number in years, as we continue to raise the bar for what this university can be. And let me say quickly what we won't do. I know we're going to talk mostly about what we will do, what we won't do. Some colleges boost their prestige and improve their ranking by becoming more, ex more exclusive. That is, they get better by turning away more people, <clears throat> often by ginning up more applications for expressly that purpose. We categorically reject, pun fully intended, we categorically reject this approach, and we always will. Now, making hands-on learning part of every Montclair student's education has myriad benefits. Students learn to apply classroom lessons in real time. They feel the satisfaction of making an impact, and they deliver on our promise to be a force multiplier for social progress. Of course, this is our original purpose. Montclair, as we've heard, was created to train teachers. And although we blossomed in a multitude of directions, we never lost that orientation. The newer parts of our university, like our still young nursing school embody the same leap of imagination that says a liberal arts education can be fused with career preparation. The bias that says otherwise was and is elitist and exclusionary in effect, if not intent. And we are committed to continually redesign our university to put our students in a position to both thrive professionally and grow intellectually. The two can go together. And to that end, I'm excited to announce that following the recommendation of a faculty committee charged by Provost Gonzalez, 
we will launch a new college focused on the health professions and contributing to community well-being that draws on strength across the university. At the same time, we will recommit to our core historical commission and create a college laser focused on education, on education reimagined. These will be two new powerhouses. Future educators and health professionals will engage with our talented faculty in an environment of inquiry and innovation. They will have practical learning opportunities to reinforce and contextualize classroom instruction. Thank you, Superintendent Leone, for highlighting the fantastic Red Hawks Rising partnership, a perfect example. And for the record, I can spread just like the best policy debaters and get a lot of words in too. And I won't tell you that if you don't agree with me, the world will end in nuclear war, which is what most policy debaters will tell you. <laughs> it's true. This approach will yield problem solvers and adaptive learners ready to take on all challenges. It requires deep collaborative partnerships in the communities we serve. To achieve our purpose, we must erase the lines that separate campus from community. 160 years ago, the Morrill Act imagined this possibility with the creation of land-grant universities. President Lincoln signed this law in the middle of the Civil War because he knew the extension of the university into community would drive the agricultural and industrial development of a growing nation. Now we must forge a new model of an engaged university that advances community aspirations rather than merely test theories. It's truly gratifying to have May, uh, Mayor Andre Saig here from Patterson. I'm so excited by what is taking shape in this important dynamic city. We have embarked on a series of initiatives that involve us partnering with local nonprofits, government agencies, businesses, community groups, and philanthropies to build a stronger community. In fact, when I was doing research for my interview, as one does scanning Google Maps, I came across this really cool looking old stadium near a beautiful waterfall. You heard about it already, Hinchliffe Stadium and Great Falls National Park. In the coming weeks, we will announce a significant role for the university in the revival of Hinchliffe Stadium that uses the incredible history of Patterson as a teaching tool to advance K-12 students. And as you heard, this is just the beginning. We have a lot of things that we're going to do together. I cannot wait. And it's not limited to Patterson. It's not limited to Montclair. It's not limited to Clifton, Little Falls, or Newark. This is what we will do anywhere and everywhere. We are welcomed as a partner. And where somebody thinks Montclair State University can help advance their aspirations, we are eager to be a partner. All of this, all of this is fantastic, and it's an extension of the work that the talented and committed faculty of MSU have accomplished all over New Jersey. We need to support, amplify, and empower all of those efforts. That is why we will build a first-of-its-kind community action nexus that will serve as a hub for faculty, staff, and students seeking to connect, and a front door for those communities who see the university as a potential partner. Finally, and I mean that. To quote another of New Jersey's great bards, or not to quote him, but to refer to his work, we are more than halfway there. Come on. This is, this is, this is a, this is a, this is a boss crowd. I got it. I got it. One of the most impressive demonstrations of, um, of imagination's power is the birth of this nation as a functioning constitutional democracy. Rather than simply detach from the British Empire, and I know people might be confused about this right now, but we did detach from the British Empire. <laughs> the founders imagined a country governed through elections with representation and participation defined by rules that established and limited authority. Now, it was deeply flawed in many ways. Our country's origins were rooted in the twin evils of slavery and the dispossession and genocide of Native Americans. And many of the prejudices and inequities of that time were hardwired into the system that was created. Still, the democracy that was born under the Constitution proved capable of adapting, improving, addressing some flaws through amendment and evolution. Professor Collins called me out for my man crush on Frederick Douglass. 
I am guilty as charged. <laughs> Douglas is one of the greatest Americans ever, precisely because this remarkable individual, born into slavery without even his personhood, recognized by the laws of the land, somehow saw the possibility, somehow possessed the incredible imagination to envision an America where he and his descendants would have the rights and responsibilities. So we should have the imagination to see beyond the flaws in our democracy today. It's still a young experiment that we're trying to get right. We will have that democracy if we have the imagination and the doggedness that Frederick Douglass possessed, and we have an obligation to do nothing less. This democracy will not be sustained without us reinforcing a spirit of public service. Universities must lead the way. This university must lead the way. I feel really strongly about that one. <laughs> the strong embrace of public service and civic engagement at Montclair with a vibrant Bonner Leaders program and multiple AmeriCorps programs is a big part of what drew me here. My goal is ultimately that every Montclair University student will have a public service experience as part of their education here and we will become, as the video said, New Jersey's premier public service university. As an important step toward achieving that aspiration, I am pleased to announce that we have launched the Next Generation Service Corps at Montclair State University. This program builds on an initiative that I led at ASU to establish the first four-year comprehensive public service leadership program for students across the university. We then worked with our partners at the Volcker Alliance, founded by another great New Jerseyan Fed Chairman Paul Volcker, to set up a national network with the goal of reaching all 50 states by 2030. Montclair State University's first next-gen service corps cohort is launching right now. And I'm extremely confident that with all of your help, Montclair students will be leaders in growing a national movement, a national movement of universities that already includes schools like Penn State, University of Washington, Indiana, Georgia State, and yes, CUNY. As it should. So, so this is the Montclair State University of my imagination. It is a prototype, a prototype of a public serving university that we need today. One that expands opportunity, invents solutions, empowers problem solvers, engages our communities, and reinvigorates our democracy. We can make it come into being as surely as inventors, artists, and scientists have brought their ideas to life for millennia. I know we can do it, because the stories that our students, alumni, faculty, and staff have shared prove it. The journeys they have taken to Montclair and from Montclair are filled with challenges, setbacks, denials, defeats, and disappointment. And yet they are inspiring and hopeful because they underscore the undeniable power of dogged determination, grit, and short-term memory. They end in triumph, success, and a reinforced sense of purpose. They illustrate the inability of naysaying doubters to quash unbending will. And they show the sustaining power of support from loved ones who make it possible for us to do anything. We must do this. The stakes are simply too high. But I believe that universities committed to advancing the public good are essential to conquering every problem that confronts us today. And I know Montclair State University will be among those leading the way. Now, does all this sound outlandish? Perhaps. But we gather today at a beautiful Spanish mission campus, improbably situated on a former quarry in northern New Jersey. Who could have imagined that instead of eva uh, excavating calcite and other minerals from the basalt bedrock today, we would be mining human potential and transformative ideas? You know who imagined that? our forebears, the architect of the New Jersey State Normal School of Montclair, and every successive generation that made this remarkable institution what it is today. They imagined the university for which the moment called, and they built it. Now it is our turn to answer the bell. Carpe diem. Thank you.
Please welcome back Board Chairman Francis Cuss to conclude the ceremony. Wow. Th thank you so much, President Coppell, for your imagination and your exciting vision. Under your leadership, the leadership so eloquently described by President Cole earlier on this afternoon, I know that Montclair State University will indeed soar to new heights. Just a thought to conclude today. I want to share with you the observations of a former president of Indiana University about the many qualities necessary to serve as a university president. Today, I offer them to you, Jonathan, as a blessing. May you have the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of an athlete, the cunning of Machiavelli, the courage of a lion, the wings of a red hawk, the skin of a rhino, and hopefully may you develop the stomach of a goat. <laughs> so we wish you much success and many happy meals in the years to come, President Cavell. So this concludes the investor ceremony. I want to thank you for sharing this occasion with us. Please remain seated until the recession is complete and then join us outdoors for a reception. Continue the celebration in the lovely weather. Chair, Thanks so Chair much. Yes, I would like to give my selfie. Oh, so Would you join me? I, I, I almost forgot the selfie. Like, that would be really bad. Could I do a selfie too? All right, is everybody ready? All right, here we go. Oh, a joint selfie, that's unprecedented. <laughs> okay. Very good, thank okay. you.